Alaska Airlines, one of the other airlines in the US. Not quite the big three, not quite a budget carrier, somewhere in the middle. Earlier this year, we looked at their first class product from San Francisco to Boston, as well as their brand new super large lounge at their San Francisco hub. Today, however, we are in Anchorage for a few reasons. First off, I've never flown Alaska Airlines from Alaska. Also, it is the launch point for the longest flight in their route network by distance from their Anchorage hub to New York JFK. Now, I do have to specify by distance because they actually just announced a new seasonal route from Seattle to Liberia, Costa Rica, which is barely shorter than this route, but has a longer block time on the return, meaning that it's the longest by time, and this is the longest by distance. And lastly, because I have more information on whether or not Alaska will integrate lie flat seats in the future to their first or business class cabins. That's enough briefing though, timestamps will be down below so you can find what you're looking for. Welcome to Anchorage, Alaska. Now the fun fact about the Anchorage airport is it's essentially on the same land as the Lake Hood seaport base. The Alaska Department of Transportation lists it as the largest and busiest seaplane port in the world. And the rumor when I got my seaplane license is that it is one of the seaport bases with lighted runways, one of only a couple in the world. Although, to be honest, I've never tested that out. If you've watched my Condor video, you know that Anchorage has two terminals. The North Terminal, which is basically the International Arrivals Facility, and this terminal, the South Terminal, which is basically all of the departures. Alaska is obviously the biggest carrier in this terminal, and just like in San Francisco, it's predominantly self-service kiosks. Now, in an effort to be environmentally friendly, Alaska encourages everybody to have their boarding pass on their personal device instead of printing it. When you go up to the self-service kiosk, you'll show them the boarding pass on your phone, it'll print out your bag tag, and you can take it to the bag drop stand. Makes it wildly efficient. But if you do need a paper boarding pass, or if you have questions, there are still agents for you to talk to. On my walk to security, I loved the local touches in the airport. Things to show off the native people and land. They also had a barber shop outside security, so if you got to your trip and realized you didn't get your haircut, you have one last chance before you depart. Through security, the first thing we saw was a pillar showcasing the quote, new non-stop New York service that will fly. Also, a large moose and a ceiling that looks almost three-dimensional. From there, there's basically two wings of gates. There's the B gates and the C gates. Our flight and lounge is in the C gates, where the first thing we pass is the observation deck, which is unfortunately still roped off as it was temporarily a Delta pop-up club. No matter, as we continue walking down the Seagate concourse past plenty more local art, decor, and shops, which they do a great job of, kinda reminds me of Johannesburg. There's also a statue of former senator and namesake of the airport, Ted Stevens. I'll also mention that both main runways are in view out of pretty much any window, making for some great plane spotting if you have to kill some time. We have to kill some time, but we get to do that in the Alaska Lounge, which is in the beginning part of the sea concourse and upstairs, or elevator, depending on how many bags you have with you, and open during pretty much all times of the day that flights are operating. Honestly, when I first walked in, I couldn't help but feel like the lounge was pretty small, getting fairly crowded with all of these flights going back to the mainland United States soon. When you first enter, there's this little dining section off to your left. A pretty small section, not really a big main course type of option, but if you want to build a salad, or maybe have a small snack, they do have some stuff for you. Then the lounge basically stretches out in two directions. On one side you can see this narrow corridor with some seats against the window in groups and single seats facing the window across the aisle with better spaces to work. Now immediately inside the lounge, there's a cluster of seating in this central area and the main bar where they have bartenders to make you drinks, including their featured cocktail. You also, directly adjacent, can go to the self-service drinks for soft drinks, juices, coffee, or their famous pancake machines. You can see the central area here located across from the bar, and as we pan to the right, you'll see that this is pretty much the end of the lounge. I do appreciate the area with the TV and especially a nice fireplace. This side of the lounge is better for solo travelers, with many more single seats and high stools against the window. 
I had to make myself some kind of salad since the chili wasn't exactly calling my name. I did however have to try that blueberry tundra lemonade cocktail that they're serving. It was incredible and fascinating. Never thought I'd drink blueberry vodka. Now just like down in the main part of the terminal, you can get some pretty good plane spotting here from one floor higher. Out in front of you is both of the main runways for arriving and departing aircraft and also the main parking spots, so pretty much any aircraft that's flying in Anchorage you're going to see from this lounge. Different airlines from the US and Canada, but a ton of cargo airlines. It was also fun to see the Condor A330neo push back and eventually take off for Frankfurt, Alaska's only long haul route, also served by Discover Airlines. Eventually, my aircraft had arrived from Juneau, had to taxi in and turn around for New York, but I was seated in a perfect spot to watch it arrive to the gate. Now for those of you familiar with Alaska, no matter their mergers, they've managed to stay all Boeing. At the moment, their entire fleet is 737s with 240 active aircraft. Of those, however, only five of them are the 737 MAX 8 variant. The MAX 8 being lower capacity, but longer range. So they only have five because they only need it on certain routes. Anchorage to JFK being one of those routes. I made my way down to the gate a little bit early so that I could be towards the front of the people boarding and get some better shots. One of the bummers about a single aisle airplane is it's kind of hard to step into an aisle and get good camera footage. So you kind of have to get your footage and sit down quickly. Fortunately, I was the first person on after those needing some extra assistance getting down the jet bridge. With that, I welcome you on board Alaska's 2-2 business class slash first class setup on their 737 MAX 8s. It's actually the same seat that you'll find on the MAX 9 and the same seat that is going to be put in the other 737s shortly. It does have a six-way adjustable headrest, curling at the edges, tilting forwards and backwards, and moving up and down, despite not staying up. I actually found the seat itself to be fairly hard, although it's plenty wide. Along the window is an armrest. That armrest has a flap that hides the tray table which can fold out, you can either pull it out halfway or unfold it all the way. Regardless of how you take it out, however, you can use this little tab to hold your personal device entertainment, whether you use a phone or an iPad. Why is that so important? Well, because you can see where the screen would be on most aircraft. On Alaska, however, it's just a literature pocket. No seatback entertainment screen. I do like the pocket down below because it's separated into two spaces so that you can separate the items that you're going to put in there. There is underseat storage for your backpack. However, because of the footrest, you might want to use the spot in the middle which can be shared by both passengers so that both of you can lower your footrest. Obviously your bag would obstruct that, but the footrest can go all the way down or there's a halfway down click as well. The center console has a USB and universal charging port. On the side of it there is a little pocket to hold whatever items you'd like to keep extra handy next to you here. On top of the console there's also a nice size countertop to share with your seatmate and a cup holder so you don't accidentally spill whatever drinks you've got. That's also where you find the button to recline the seat. Here you can see the full recline, as mentioned in my previous video, it's unfortunately not that great of a recline, which is bad news for this 6.5 hour red eye. But at least these narrow bodies all have overhead air vents. Speaking of drinks, our pre-departure beverage choices were orange juice or water, and we also got a blanket at the seat as well. But that was it, those were the only amenities given. Anchorage and aviation are truly a match made in heaven. Over time, the purpose of Anchorage has varied, but the main thing is that the world of aviation needs it to fully thrive, specifically for flights between North America and Asia. Anchorage largely served a military purpose for the US once they got it from Russia as the 49th state. It was a great base close to East Asia for quick response times. This was kinda its only purpose though, other from minor airline services until the Cold War. As many of you know, in these days, Soviet airspace was the most restrictive in the world. Pretty much every airline was banned from entering it, making it impossible for airlines to fly from East Asia to Europe, routes that are critical for diplomatic and business ties. To combat that, Anchorage grew to become a refueling stop along the way. Air France, for example, would fly from Paris to Anchorage, remaining north of Soviet airspace, then fly a second leg from Anchorage to Tokyo. 
Anchorage was dubbed the crossroads of the world, as they saw airlines from nearly every continent and grew to become one of the world's largest airports. Anchorage had officially become overgrown in their sole terminal, so in 1982 they built a second terminal to accommodate the traffic. Things were going swimmingly until in the mid-1980s when Gorbachev reopened Siberian airspace to select airlines, and the then new 747-400 could make the Europe to East Asia flight non-stop, meaning this brand new terminal in Anchorage was left empty and their traffic and revenue plummeted. If you've seen my Condor video, you've seen the new terminal, the one that mostly sits empty these days. Anchorage saw a major slow point while it solidified its role as a cargo hub. They have had a couple international flights at times, but largely fly strictly to Canada and the US. Other than that, it remains a diversion point for ETOPS, and more importantly, as a world cargo hub. It actually ranked as the world's fourth largest airport by cargo. This will largely remain true as Anchorage's location allows aircraft to carry less fuel and therefore more cargo. They just have to use Anchorage as a fuel stop to make the rest of their journey. For whatever reason, Anchorage's unique location has always given it an advantage, and even if we didn't get to see the Cold War boom, it's still fun seeing how the airport supports the main city of America's least dense state. I don't want to go too much into the in-flight entertainment since we covered it in the last Alaska video, but as mentioned, the personal device entertainment is the only type of entertainment. Fortunately, there are power ports at every seat on board, but you basically connect to the Wi-Fi system. It takes you to their portal, where you can purchase Wi-Fi or access all the entertainment for free. There is a good selection of movies and TV shows you can see all the categories they sort by. The TV shows, unfortunately, don't always have that many episodes but they do have specialty episodes to the teams they sponsor, shout out to those Giants fans. I did purchase the Wi-Fi on this flight so that I could do some work on this Anchorage to New York Red Eye. Checking the speeds, you can see that, honestly, it was pretty fast for airplane Wi-Fi, and all for $8. Hopefully moving towards free as that's becoming the industry standard, but $8 is better than nothing. There isn't exactly menus on Alaska's flights, but they do have cards with all of the drink options on the seatback pocket. 
That's how I knew I wanted to try their lager, which came with a side of snack mix. For the food options, you can pre-order them. They are available through the app or online. Otherwise, they came through before departure to ask what we wanted to order. I've heard good things about their catering, and especially about their burgers, so that was my choice. It came with some toppings and their signature sauce on the side, also served with a small caprese type salad, a warm bread roll, and a warm chocolate chip cookie. Honestly, a pretty darn good burger, even by ground standards. Once the meal wrapped up, the sun was setting as we were getting past all the most beautiful scenery. It was then that I realized that I better not have to go to the bathroom because my seatmate had fallen asleep, and unless I wanted to wake him up, I wasn't getting out of this seat until probably landing. You can see here, especially with the seat in front of you reclined, there's essentially no room to get past your seat neighbor. So if you're in a window seat, be prepared to hold it. They did offer us some waters before sleep, and then I decided to get some work done, where apparently I fell asleep at some point, because a few hours later I woke up to my water and laptop in the same place, but now it was bright outside. Now that my seatmate was finally awake, it was time to go use the lavatory. I was reminded harshly that the 737 MAX lavatories are tight, especially the sinks, more so in the back, but it almost looks like they were forgotten and then added last minute. In the forward galley, there is a snack basket. You could go up at any time and grab whatever snacks you wanted, so at some point I decided to get a kind bar and a bag of popcorn. Yay for the snack basket, boo for the fact that on a six and a half hour red eye flight, we only got the one meal. For most airlines, you would expect a breakfast before arrival as well. To prove that I do listen to y'all, I saw the sheer amount of comments on my last Alaska video on your mostly negative opinions on this product, especially on these longer routes. Some of you had great conversations with me about it on Instagram as well. Ahem, go follow me at Patrick Flies Planes. Since then, I did a bit of digging into the topic of what cabin upgrades Alaska has planned for the future. As a matter of fact, on August 16th of this year, Alaska did announce a major first and premium class expansion. Unfortunately, probably not what y'all were wanting. All it really states is that starting in September, the 800, 900, and MAX 9737s will be getting more premium seats. The 800s will get another row of first class, and the 900s and MAX 9s will keep first class as is, but add more premium seating, or basically extra legroom economy. The Recaro seats we see here will also be added to all the planes that don't have it, and all main cabin passengers will have cup holders, USB-C ports, and six-way headrests, all while keeping four onboard lavatories, and all while the MAX 8s remain largely untouched. So what about lie flat seats? Longtime Alaska Flyers will know that that's never going to happen. They have actually dropped out of non-hub premium routes in the past, like Los Angeles to New York, since they couldn't compete with Delta, JetBlue, American, and United, which all offer lie flat services on that route. Alaska did send out a survey this year asking what items premium passengers valued the most, listing things like lounges, beverages, seats, private terminal spaces, etc., and did actually mention lie flat seats explicitly a few times. Although with the recent expansion announcement, it sounds like they didn't get as many people asking for those lie flats. Possibly because these seats would likely reduce the seat count and therefore offer less upgrade space unless they removed economy seating. Also because people fear that the price would increase with a product like that. Although recently when booking a flight home from New York to San Francisco, United, American, and Alaska all had about the same cost for business class. It's just that Alaska didn't have the lie flats, so I chose not them since this reminds me more of a premium economy seat with a hot meal. But hey, it's still better than European business class. The only thing that hurts my brain is comparing Alaska's product to the product they merged with in Virgin America and what they used to have. Granted, it was a decade ago by now, but Virgin had 55 degrees of recline, a leg rest, and was flat enough for some great sleep. It honestly reminds me of the international first classes of the 80s and 90s. Alaska claims that their selling point is their soft product with the best crews and meals. I just feel like it's putting a lot of pressure on those aspects, even if the crew today was incredible. A former Virgin America flight attendant, who then ended up with Alaska, spoke on this actually. Granted, it was through Reddit, so take it with caution, I guess. She said that Virgin America used to pay a large premium for first class flight attendants. I believe it was six or eight times pay if I recall correctly so they really tried to offer the best service for the extra money. 
plus with wider aisles and only 8 seats, it was a roomier feeling cabin. Not to mention the flight attendants really got to know everyone on these flights. Alaska still pays a premium for first class flight attendants it seems, but it's much less. The article I read was that it was two times pay, so the flight attendant said that there's less people striving for these positions, and they're more at risk of being dumped off to a reserve flight attendant or someone who maybe isn't as passionate as they could have been at Virgin. Virgin America also had collectible amenity kits and bedding, of which Alaska only offers blankets and only on select routes, so even the soft products are a bit lacking in areas. Personally, in a perfect world, I'd like to see Alaska with a subfleet with a premium cabin. A cabin where they can place lie-flat seats in business class and offer real amenities. Picture American Airlines, for example. The A320 family has a similar looking first class, except for the premium routes from JFK and Miami across the country to places like San Francisco and Orange County, where they have A321s with lie flat seats and basically an international business class standard. That is how I feel Alaska should move forward, since these planes definitely work in the less premium routes, which is most of their network. It's also worth mentioning that if the merger with Hawaiian goes through, the wide bodies all have lie flats, so some routes will see that product. The biggest thing is that they aren't a regional carrier anymore. They have long routes in premium markets with serious competition, and I just feel like with everyone announcing new first class offerings from American to Spirit, Alaska's falling behind the new standard. Oh, and lastly, if you have a gripe with why they call it first class, I totally get it. Check out my video on American Airlines domestic first class recently which explains why this is common practice in the US. Alaska isn't alone in the opinions of the US domestic first class products. Whereas most carriers offer a very similar looking product on domestic or medium haul international routes, airlines like United, Delta, and American do have premium products for routes that require it, something that Alaska doesn't. Fortunately, this does allow for Alaska to use these aircraft on pretty much any route, but it has drawn some criticism. I won't lie, Alaska does have one of the better economy classes out there, but when it comes to business class it seems like they're losing their competitive edge. That being said, Alaska does have its perks and on my last Alaska video plenty of y'all spoke on that, mostly their customer service of which they won many awards over the year. Question is, is it enough to keep people coming back? I will say that the loyal Alaska followers aren't going anywhere anytime soon, regardless of what first class product they put out there. When it comes to United, Delta, or American, I don't see as many people jumping ship to Alaska unless they live in San Francisco, Portland, Seattle, or Alaska. I will say, however, that a friend of mine recently made the switch from Delta to Alaska, and when I was talking to him about it, he quoted the mileage plan system, saying that it works more on distance than cost since their pricing and routes are a bit different. He found this a bit easier to reach one world elite status, especially when flying with partner airlines. I guess everyone has what they value more, so who am I to say what's best? All I have is my personal opinion, which is that the three legacy carriers are a bit more my style. Well, I'll let y'all tell me down below what you prefer. Let me know, and until next Sunday, safe travels. I'll see y'all next time.